All right, well, we are going to be talking about the uh, conscience this morning. Just have an opportunity to do really a, a one-off equipping hour on the conscience. And to open our time, I just want to draw your attention to 1 Timothy, just by way of introduction. So if you would turn to 1 Timothy chapter 1. 1 Timothy chapter 1, verse 18 and 19. Paul writes to, to Timothy, 1 Timothy 1, 18. This command I entrust to you, Timothy, my son, in accordance with the prophecies previously made concerning you, that by them you fight the good fight, keeping faith and a good conscience, which some have rejected and suffered shipwrecked in regard to their faith. So you have in this passage Paul giving Timothy this charge in 1 Timothy, uh, this charge to fight this good fight. And he says, in accordance with the, the prophecies made about you, Timothy was uh, ordained by God for this role. He was gifted. Uh, there was hands laid on him by the, the sending church. He was affirmed in this calling. And, and what Paul has in mind for him, what God has in mind for him, is to, to fight uh, a good fight. As he puts out false teachers uh, in the church in, in Ephesus, as he strengthens the church, as he builds up elders in the church, as he preaches the word, uh, this is going to be a fight. And in this fight, Paul is going to give him the, the instructions of how to battle. When we think about the, the Christian battle, a fight. You think about passages like Ephesians 6, and you might consider a spiritual warfare, right? Battle against the enemy, against Satan and all his devices. But the fight that Paul has in mind here, you can see in verse 19. Well, what is this fight? Well, this is actually a, an internal battle, a battle in the heart. Verse 19, he says, keeping faith and a good conscience. That is the, the battleground for Timothy. It is a fight of faith. Faith and a good conscience. So you think about two, two ideas here. Faith would be his trust in God, his trust in God's promises, his trust in God's character. So this is the, the battleground, is to, to continue to trust the Lord, to continue to trust his word. And then also the battleground is to maintain a, a good conscience. This is the, the battle against sin, the battle for a, a pure life, a pure thought life. A blameless character, a battle to keep short accounts with sin, to fight against temptation. So this is the, the battleground for Timothy. And we're going to talk about this morning just a, a good conscience, really zero in on this one, one aspect of the battle, a fight for a, a clean conscience. And this, this study really stems out of uh, this book, I actually stole, stole the title. So the title of this is The Duty and Blessing of a Tender Conscience. Uh, it's from a book here. Uh, we actually have it on the book table. I think it's uh, $11 on the book table by Timothy Crusoe, a Puritan. And uh, think about the phrase, don't judge a book by its cover. Well, usually we use that about people, but I think that's true for this book. You look at it, despite the, uh, the kind of, uh, you know, 90s artwork, it is uh, just an excellent, excellent resource. So just really devotional, talking about just maintaining a, a tender conscience. So I read the book and I thought, man, there's some really helpful things here. So just have the opportunity to bring some of those things out. So really, a lot of it's going to be practical, uh, just some practical application. This is what it looks like to, to maintain a, a pure conscience, a tender heart for the Lord. So uh, just by way of, uh, just show you the outline, just kind of looking at three aspects. First, we're going to look at just a framework of what, what the conscience is, what it isn't, just spend a little bit of time just talking about the, the conscience. And then we're going to look at uh, what, what Timothy Crusoe calls the ingredients of a tender conscience. Really, like, what are the attitudes to cultivate? What must I cultivate in my heart to maintain a, a tender conscience? And then thirdly, uh, is, uh, is really, what do, what do I go after? Just the practical application. That's where I want to spend the time. He, he just has a list of really practical things to go after in life. Uh, some of it are, are temptations and battlegrounds. Some of it are, are things you could do tomorrow as you wake up. So we're going to look through those, uh, maintaining a tender conscience. Really, it's the, the actions to go after. So first is just the framework here. What is the conscience? What it is? What it isn't? Um, Andrew Nacelli, in another book we actually have at the book table on the conscience, by Andrew Nacelli, he defines the conscience as, uh, the, he says, the conscience is your consciousness of what you believe is right and wrong. And by consciousness, he means your sense or awareness, your own awareness of what you believe is right and wrong. I think it's helpful the way he says that, what you believe is right and wrong. 
Your conscience is not, is not the same as Scripture. You're trying to inform it with Scripture. But it is an indication of what you think is true. What you think you should and shouldn't do. I mean, we all, we all think about the conscience as, you know, the movies. You kind of have the good and the bad cop telling you, do this, don't do this. But there is a recognition there, even in, even in, a, in a movie, even in a, a cartoon, that there's something that's, that's speaking to us, that's saying, don't do this, do this. That God has actually put in our hearts uh, this moral compass. He's put his law in our hearts, it says in Romans. Uh, he also, Nacelli in that, in that book, also talks about the conscience being a, a capacity for moral judgment, uh, inward capacity for moral restraint. Animals don't have a, a conscience, they don't have that capacity, but all humans have this capacity, this internal reality, uh, God's law written on the heart. Uh, it's like a muscle, we talk about it like a capacity, I think that's a helpful way to think about it, like a muscle, something that you can, you can build, something you can strengthen, something that can also atrophy, that can, that can weaken, that can grow dull. Uh, I read this stat that after you turn 30, your muscles start to shrink every single year. I think it's like half a percent a year. So every 10 years, you're going to lose 5% of your muscle mass. And that's a little startling. You actually, have to, you actually have to work on building muscle after you turn 30 or else it will shrink. Well, same way with the conscience. This is something you have to maintain. You could, you could consider it a, a muscle, something you have to work on, something you have to cultivate. Uh, Timothy Crusoe says about the conscience, he says, the conscience carries in it the application of general knowledge to particular actions. General knowledge to particular actions. So taking what God says is true, what do I know about the world? What does God say? The principles, the truths of scripture, and now applying those to certain situations in life. Should I do this thing? Should I do this action? How should I raise my kids? How should I respond to this conversation? taking general principles and applying it to, to specific actions. Uh, he also, a uh, helpful illustration is just thinking of the conscience like a, uh, like a skylight, comparing a skylight to a, a light bulb. Uh, the conscience is like a skylight. It's not a light bulb in the sense that it doesn't have its own light. It is a, it is a mirror. It is a reflection of God's truth. So your conscience is informed by God's truth. It reflects what God says. It is not its own source of truth. And it can be informed. It can be informed by what God says. It can be informed by worldliness, by worldly thinking, by other, other thoughts can inform your conscience falsely. And turn to, to Hebrews 10.22. Hebrews 10.22 is such a helpful place just to look at the, just the, the blessing of a, of a clean conscience. Just thinking about, again, what is the conscience? Hebrews 10.22 says, let us draw near, that is, draw near to God with a sincere heart in full assurance of faith, having our hearts sprinkled clean from an evil conscience and our bodies washed with pure water. Do you have the, the blood of Christ cleansing our consciences? But before you were a, a believer, all you had was guilt. All you had was a guilty conscience, a conscience that would scream at you, this one is guilty. This one deserves judgment. And here in Hebrews 10.22, we see that, that Christ's blood, that, that the salvation purchased for us at the cross, that Christ has actually cleansed our conscience. That we can actually, we can actually be not guilty to have a clean conscience, to, to walk in freedom in Christ. You think about every, every works-based religion in the world, every works-based system trying to, to cleanse their own conscience. If I do these things, if I follow these rules, if I do these rituals every week, every day, going after a, a, a burdened conscience, how do I cleanse my conscience? I must do these things. And all they're doing is just further enslaving their conscience. There's no freedom there. There's no cleansing there. But for the believer, we have a, a clean conscience purchased, purchased by the blood of Christ. This is only true of the believer. And with that, there is also a, a danger that we can, we can sear our conscience Throughout Scripture, you see this idea, especially in the New Testament, of, of searing the conscience, of making decisions that would actually harden your heart, harden your conscience, so that you can't see as clearly as you, as you give in to sin willingly. So that's the, the nature of this, of this book, the nature of, of really this study, is just to look at how do we maintain a, a tender heart, a tender conscience, 
to walk in light of this truth of Hebrews 10.22, that we have a clean conscience, that we can live without guilt, without fear of judgment because of what Christ has done. So we, we all want that. We want a conscience that's working effectively. We want to, to walk in freedom and joy in a strong faith. In 1 Timothy 1, he, he talks about that, that connection of, of keeping faith and a good conscience. That those things go hand in hand. The, the, the reality of, of our grasp of, of Christ, of his work, our trust in his word, it goes hand in hand with our, our tender conscience. The more tender our conscience, the more clearly we're going to see what Christ has done on the cross, the more clearly we're going to trust in his promises, the more comfort we're going to find in his word. So it is a, a duty for us and a privilege to maintain a tender conscience. Uh, one author says that a, a tender conscience is the, the best pillow to enjoy the Christian life. To, you know, just even think about practically laying your head down at night with a clean conscience. that You can sleep with ease. And on the flip side, you think about the, the, just the, the pain, the, the guilt uh, of having a, a conscience that is bruised. Uh, having a conscience that becomes hardened because you have not responded to, to God's instruction to you, because you've held on to unrepentant sin. So this is the battleground, to, to not harbor sin patterns, to not keep sin hidden, but to keep short accounts, to confess sin, to have a soft heart uh, to the Lord, to his word. And just uh, before I jump into some of the, the practical things, just want to say what, what a tender conscience is not. What it's not. A tender conscience is not... Uh, on one hand, just, just guilt. You could think of, okay, a conscience that's working rightly is a conscience that feels guilt when I do something wrong. Well, yeah, that, there's, there's truth in that. There would be guilt, but you think about just feeling guilty is not, is not the uh, evidence of a tender conscience. Obviously, what comes to mind is, is Judas. Uh, if you think about a, a burdened conscience, Judas had probably the most burdened conscience. Threw the money back at the, the feet of the Pharisees and said, you know, I, I don't want this. I'm, I'm guilty of innocent blood. But then what does Judas do? Judas goes and hangs himself. That's not a tender conscience. That's guilt. That's burden. That's fear of judgment, but not in a, in a tender way, not in a, in a way that's actually exalting Christ. Uh, what the conscience also is not is on the flip side, it wouldn't be a, just, just a lack of remorse is not an indication of a, of a pure conscience, of a, of a tender conscience. You could have a seared conscience and not feel regret. That doesn't mean that, oh man, I'm walking in freedom because I don't feel regret. Uh, turn real quick to Proverbs. There's a couple uh, pretty, pretty scary observations in Proverbs here just about the, the nature of, a, of an unburdened conscience. Just two passages real quick. Proverbs 30, verse 20. Proverbs 30, 20 says, this is the way of an adulterous woman. She eats and wipes her mouth and says, I have done no wrong. So that's a, that's a little bit terrifying to have someone that's caught in adultery and is at the same time saying, I've done nothing wrong. No burden, no guilt. And turn back a, a few pages to, to Proverbs chapter 7. You have the same idea here. Proverbs 7, starting in verse 8, the, the adulterous woman Proverbs 7, verse 8, you have the, the young man that, that walks through, through her street to her house. Verse 8, it says, Passing through the street near her corner, he takes the way to her house. In the twilight, in the evening, in the middle of the night, and in the darkness, and behold, a woman comes to meet him, dressed as a harlot and cunning of heart. She is boisterous and rebellious. Her feet do not remain at home. She is now in the streets, now in the squares, and lurks by every corner. She seizes him and kisses him, and with a brazen face, she says to him, and this is the part to, to zero in on here, she says, I was due to offer peace offerings. Today I have paid my vows. Therefore, I have come out to meet you, to seek your presence earnestly, and I have found you. So verse 14, you see that she is saying, I have, I have paid my vows, I have made my peace offerings, I have done all of these religious acts, you know, almost saying, I, I have a clean conscience, I've done everything right, I'm religious. I'm following all the rules. And you see just a lack of remorse as, as they're going after adultery. So, so a lack of remorse does not mean a clean conscience. A clean conscience has to be informed by Scripture. 
And one other thing that a, that a clean or a tender conscience is not, is not just uh, external conformity. And you know this, you could have external conformity to, to rules, you could have conformity to, to even scripture principles on the outside, to do the right things externally, to respond the right way in a conversation, to respond with gentleness. In your heart, there's, there's frustration, there's anger, there's bitterness, right? To smile and pretend like everything's okay and to, to hold a grudge against somebody. So external conformity is not, is not the same thing as a, as a tender conscience. Uh, 1 Timothy 4 is so helpful in this. Uh, even just thinking about our, I think our, our bent, you could see two different, two different aspects when you think about, about conscience, even just a pure life. You have uh, in Jude, it talks about the, the men who, who infiltrate the church, who have, who have a, a burdened conscience, who have a seared conscience. In, in Jude 4, they actually undermine the grace of Christ for licentiousness. For, for wicked living, and they actually deny Christ by their, by their lifestyle, by just licentiousness, by, by immorality. So that's on the one hand. You could say, okay, the opposite of that then is I have to, to not do those things. I have to have a set of rules. So I must just say no to everything. Saying no to everything is the same as having a tender conscience. Well, obviously, that's, that's not the answer. If you, if you look at 1 Timothy 4, verses 2 and 3, 1 Timothy 4, verse 2, Paul says, by means of the hypocrisy of liars, seared in their own conscience as with a branding iron, men who forbid marriage and advocate abstaining from foods which God has created to be gratefully shared in by those who believe and know the truth. So you see there uh, men that have a a seared conscience. And what they're doing is is not living in immorality. They're actually saying no to good things. The evidence of their seared conscience there is, uh, is saying no saying no to what God has said is good, to abstaining, to to not exercising the the freedom that Christ has purchased. So it's not just as simple as saying, okay, I can just say no to all these things and I have a clean conscience. Well, no, there a a seared conscience says no to good things. Think about Peter in Acts 10. He is actually rebuked for, for for saying no, for saying things are unclean that God has called clean. That is a rebuke to him in Acts 10. So those are just some ways to think about what the conscience is not. Okay, so what, what is a, a tender conscience? What are, what are evidences of a tender, tender conscience? What are ways to, to cultivate a tender conscience? The, this muscle that you must exercise. And we could spend you know, the rest of our time talking about what the conscience is. There's plenty of passages to look at, but I want to transition to, to next look at uh, ingredients of a tender conscience. What are the, the things you should cultivate in your life? What are the attitudes to cultivate? So we're going to look at here some, some attitudes to cultivate, and then last we'll look at some actions. What do I, what do, I do tomorrow morning? What's, what's it look like practically? So this would be, how do you get a tender conscience? Well, again, I, just, I stole all these from Timothy Crusoe in this book. So I, I heard uh, one pastor say, you know, the best, the best teachers beg, borrow, and steal. Right? They don't come up with any of their own thoughts. So these are all Timothy Crusoe's thoughts. Just want to share them with you because I thought they were so encouraging. So number one, uh, ingredient of a tender conscience is a, a hatred of sin. Hatred of sin. Uh, he says, He who is not brought to abhor that wish, that which is evil, sorry, he, is, he who is not brought to abhor that which is evil will not be as cautious of it as he should be. This is something we have to, to cultivate in our hearts, a, a hatred of evil. 1 John 3, 9 says, No one who is born of God practices sin because God's seed abides in him, and he cannot sin because he is born of God. And in that passage, it's not saying that, that we cannot ever sin. We, we never practice sin, but it's actually, a, when he says practice, it's an ongoing pattern of sin. It's a heart that actually enjoys sin, a heart that continues to practice the same sins without regret. That is not true of a believer. A believer hates sin. I heard it described as, uh, you think about poison. Poison in a, in a snake versus poison in a snake bite. For the unbeliever, they're like the, the snake that has poison in them. The snake that has poison in them, the rattlesnake, it doesn't know that it has poison. It doesn't, it doesn't feel badly for having poison. That's part of its life. That's just what it does. It's healthy because it has poison in it. It doesn't know anything different. But for the believer, it's like the, the poison that's from the snake bite. 
This poison that would kill you. This poison that, that would destroy your soul. That's, that's our nature now with, against sin. Like poison coming into us. I, I want to get rid of this. It's destroying me. It's hurting me. To, to see sin that way, like a, a poison. So just to, to cultivate this, to, re, to remind yourself that, that sin is an offense to God. It's an offense to his character. That it grieves his spirit. Uh, remember the, the ruin that sin has caused in your own life. Think about the consequences. Think about the, the blindness that it has caused to you. Think about the harm to others. Think about the guilt. Talk about the, the guilt of Judas. You, you can think of times of just guilt brought on by sin. Just the burden of guilt. Think about all the other sins that come alongside one allowed sin. When you let sin go unchecked. Remind yourself that Christ died for those sins. Remind yourself of your, your prayers that have been hindered because of sin. Remind yourself of your appetite towards Scripture that, that has been hindered, that has been diminished because of sin. Think about your affections for Christ that are, that are weakened when you sin. Thomas Brooks says of, of sin, he says, It is the only thing God abhors. It is the thing that brought Jesus to the cross, that damns souls, that shuts up heaven, and that laid the foundations of hell. So that is the, the attitude, to cultivate that attitude, a hatred of sin. Uh, second is a, a love of holiness. Again, these are ingredients of a tender conscience, the, the kind of attitudes to cultivate, a love of holiness, really the flip side of a hatred of sin, the positive, to love holiness, to love what God loves. Crusoe writes, men will be glad to make excuses when they take no pleasure in the work. He talks about a, a spontaneous cheerfulness, a desire to please the Lord. This is what Jesus says, John 14, 15, if you love me, you will obey my commandments. That our obedience must be fueled by love for Christ. There has to be a positive motivation, love for the Lord, that would fuel our obedience. That's where a tender conscience is going to come from, a positive desire. I want to please the Lord. I want to do what he says. I want to be holy because he is holy. I want to be Christ-like because I love Christ. Crusoe goes on to say, If religious exercises are not matters of delight, they will find out many inventions to stop the mouth of conscience in laying them aside. So you have to cultivate both of these, a hatred of sin and a love of righteousness, really stemming from a love of Christ. Uh, thirdly, uh, a fear of God, a fear of God. And really, this could be the, the foundation. You could say fear of God, number one. This really is the, the framework. This is how you get to, to hate sin and love righteousness. It's because you fear the Lord. And he says, planted in the soul, the fear of God must bridle to hold us when corrupt nature is ready to break out. It must fortify and secure us against temptations when indwelling sin would betray and expose us to them. Turn quickly to, to Psalm 4. Psalm 4, verses 3 and 4. It's so helpful to, to see this, just to remind ourselves Psalm 4, verse 3. Here David is talking just about the Lord's character, a, a, a cry to God, a prayer to the Lord. Verse 3 says, But know that the Lord has set apart the godly man for himself. The Lord hears when I call to him. And look at verse 4. Tremble or fear and do not sin. Meditate in your heart upon your bed and be still. So you have in verse 4 this this parallel between trembling, fear before God, before his character, and in a lack of sinning. Tremble before God and do not sin. This is where a tender conscience must start, a fear of the Lord. To acknowledge his character. To, to hate sin because you love God. To fear offending a father. To hate the thought of trampling on his grace, his kindness to you. So you have to first see him rightly. If you're going to see sin rightly, if you're going to have a tender conscience, you have to see God rightly. You have to fear him. Fourthly is, uh, Crusoe says, jealousy of ourselves. Jealousy of ourselves. And that one sounds uh, maybe a little odd. 
Well, the way he frames it, he says, uh, a godly jealousy in opposition to wicked security and careless presumption. So really, this is a realization that there is work to do. I have to work hard. I've been called out of, out of darkness into light, into God's family. And now there's work. There's a, a fight, a good fight to fight, as Paul says to Timothy. That there is work. You have to work hard to maintain purity. That you can't have a, an I'm, I've arrived attitude. Okay, I'm good. I can just coast now. But a, but in, but a longing for, for continued growth, a zeal to approve yourself to the Lord. Just an eagerness to, to demonstrate what is true in the gospel. The gospel has transformed me. Again, not out of a, a duty, but out of delight. Because Christ died for me, because I love him. I want to actually approve myself to him. Charles Spurgeon, I love this quote from Spurgeon. He says, the, the man of God exerts himself, but never trusts himself. He exerts himself, but never trusts himself. This is a, a faith-filled Jealousy of ourselves, as Crusoe says. A faith-filled, faith-filled working, not, not trusting in our efforts, trusting in Christ and working hard as we trust him. So you have to, to recognize that there is diligent work to do. So these are the, the four ingredients, really attitudes to cultivate, hatred of sin, love of holiness, fear of God, and, and a jealousy of ourselves, a working hard after this. And now, uh, just to move to, to the more practical, maintaining a tender conscience. What does it look like? What are the activities? How do I go after uh, maintaining a pure conscience? You could probably, probably guess the first one. And again, this is, a, this is actually a list of 12. And I debated just breaking down a couple of these, um, but I decided, I think, just to give you the, the full picture, and then you can do the, the harder work afterward of deciding, okay, these are the areas I need to grow in. But just to give you, here's all the categories he talks about. I think it's helpful just to have this big picture. Here's categories to think about, uh, activities, actions to go after. Number one, strive to increase in spiritual knowledge. Strive to increase in spiritual knowledge. This is uh, Bible intake. You have to know God's word. If you're going to inform your conscience, you have to know truth. You have to know what God says. Your conscience has to be informed by Scripture. That's where it has to start. He writes, Ignorance and stupidity are very naturally linked together. Where there is most blindness, there should be the greatest hardness. And he also says, The less we know, the worse we are likely to do. You think about it, he called conscience this application of general knowledge to particular actions. To say, okay, what does God say? Now, how do I apply this to this situation? Well, that necessarily, that means that you have to know what God says. I have to know what he says in order to apply it. If I'm going to do what's pleasing to the Lord in this moment, whatever situation you're confronted with, okay, Lord, what's the right thing to do here? Well, I have to know the principles of Scripture. You think about any decision you're faced with, any action. I mean, what you want in that moment when you're having to make a decision is, is you want the truth of Scripture, principles of Scripture flying through your head. Okay, this passage and this truth. Okay, God says this and he says this. So how do I, how do I take those truths and apply them to this situation? Well, that means you have to know God's word. You have to have a, an intake of Scripture, spiritual knowledge from all sources, reading the word, hearing the word preached, being, being with the saints. When God's word's open, you're there. I want to know God's word so I can please him. And we have to have a, an informed conscience. We have to have an informed conscience if we're going to actually walk in a way that's pleasing to the Lord, if we're going to obey. I was uh, talking to a friend recently that was, that was talking about his own experience, coming to the Lord out of a, just a pagan environment. Didn't grow up in church. Didn't know anything about the Bible. And it was about a year or two after he was saved where someone came alongside of him and said, he had thought... Okay, what, what sexual purity means is I have to be committed to, to one person. I have to be committed to my girlfriend. And that's, that's purity. And they said, well, no, no, no. Sexual purity is in, in a marriage. There's one place where you find purity. And he just, he didn't know. Oh, okay, I just thought it was being monogamous with one person. You just think about the, the conscience has to be informed by truth. You have to be told, this is what God says. I think about uh, Papua New Guinea. 
the missionaries there, where you step into a context where you have multiple wives, just a, a different kind of, of morality. Well, what happens when someone gets saved that has multiple wives and you're, you're trying to, to help them see the, the benefit of being a one-woman one man? This is what leaders in the church should be like, committed to one woman. What's well, going to take informing their conscience with truth? They have to have a, a conscience now that's informed by God's word. I can think about my own life, just different areas where you, you could, I'm sure you have different situations where you remember being burdened by something. Oh, I shouldn't do this. And then later, later you realize as you read scripture, as you're taught, as you're instructed, like, oh, okay, I didn't quite see that rightly. Uh, for me, just one, one example I thought of recently is I remember just living in, uh, living in Gilbert, having a lot of, uh, of Mormon neighbors. And I remember just feeling this burden, like, you know, they're inviting us to, to neighborhood potluck. And I, I remember reading 1 Corinthians 5, and Smet actually looked at this last week, 1 Corinthians 5, that says, you know, you should not even eat with someone that's, that claims to be a brother. You should not even eat with them. And in my mind, I'm like, well, I can't. I can't am I, can I have a meal with someone that, that believes in a false Christ? You know, I'm burdened by this. And, and I think there's a, a good burden in that, you know, about my, my witness in the world, not wanting to lock arms with someone that is, that is professing a false Christ, that is actually denying uh, heretically denying what Christ says about himself. But, but that passage is, is actually about not associating with those who are sexually, sexually immoral, who have actually been in the church. It really is a, a church discipline scenario. Someone that's been in the church, in the fellowship of believers, and is now walking in unrepentant sin and sexual immorality, saying don't, don't eat with them as if they're, they're, still, uh, they're still part of the congregation there. Don't have fellowship with them to affirm their, their lifestyle. So for me, it's just as I, as I read, as I was taught, okay, that passage is not, is not talking about me. There's other things to think about. How do I relate with my neighbors? But it's not, you know, to, to have that passage burden my conscience in that way. It was just helpful to say, okay, I just need to learn more truth. I need to learn what, what God says to have an informed conscience. So we have to be, uh, be students of the word to, to hear what God says, to intake truth. That's uh, number one. Two, he writes, do not take things on trust from others. Do not just take things on trust from others. And really, I summarize this as building your own convictions. And, and what this does not mean is don't, don't listen to your pastor, don't listen to teachers in the church, don't listen to your elders. That's not what he's saying. He's saying to actually to work hard to, to affirm from Scripture the things that you're being taught. Like the Bereans, they, they hear Paul teaching and they go, they go search the Old Testament scriptures. Does this actually line up with what Paul said, with what God said? Is Paul's message equal to God's message? So that's the, the encouragement here, is to actually build your own convictions. To confirm things from scripture, to actually be so rooted in scripture that you know, okay, this lines up with what God says. Or I have questions, that's not quite it. Could you help me understand that? Galatians 6.5 says that each, each one must bear his own load, must bear his own burden. That is to say that you are accountable before the Lord for you, for your own decisions, for your own actions. You're actually accountable before the Lord. You have people in your life, especially I think about kids in a home. You know, it's so easy to, to just mirror what mom and dad say. And that's good. You, have to, you, you must obey your parents. Children, obey your parents and the Lord for this is right. But there's a, there's a line between, okay, helping kids actually have their own convictions, helping them understand this is why mom and dad talk about this. This is why we do this, because God says this, because of this truth. So you have to obey while you're in our home because of this. But we actually want you to be compelled by what God says more than by what we say. And hopefully what we say lines up with what God says. But, but you must build your own convictions. I think that's true for all of us, members in the church, wives in a home. That you have to have, have your own convictions to say, this is what God says. <coughs> I want to be convinced from Scripture of what God says. I want to do it because God says it, not just because someone else says it. I think of it like uh, if any of you have been, uh, been wake surfing. Uh, wake surfing is, uh, is different than wakeboarding. Wake surfing, you're actually right behind the boat, and you're actually surfing on the, the wake of the boat. And the people that are good at wake surfing, they can actually, they, they get up on the, the wake, and they can actually let go of the rope. And the, the wake will just take them, and they just surf behind the boat as long as there's a wake. Uh, and, you know, I'm, I'm trying to do this, and you think, okay, I'm really doing it, and then you let go of the rope. And then you realize, okay, I actually, I was just, the rope was actually what was pulling me. I wasn't actually surfing on the wake. So I think of it like that, of like just 
Just not, you know, you could be, okay, I think this is, this is my own conviction. And then, and, then a, and then a trial comes, something comes at you. Do I actually believe this for myself? Am I actually convinced before the Lord that this is right? When I'm put to the test, will, will I do this? I mean, you could think of just a lot of different scenarios. I think it's something like, like alcohol, where you could have two, two sides. You could say, someone could say, I'm not going to drink alcohol because, because this person said I shouldn't, or because this person doesn't. Or on the flip side, someone could say, well, he does it, so I can do it. Rather than saying, wait, I want to work hard to, to understand what Scripture says about drunkenness, about, about intoxication, about those things. I want to build my own convictions to, to make sure that I'm living in line with what God says. And I think, uh, just think about parenting. It's, it's so hard, I think, to do this well in the home because our temptation is to, how do I control all the circumstances because I don't want my kids to, to make mistakes. I don't want them to, to do things. I obviously don't want them to sin. But, but trying to, to help them and guide them and instruct them so that they actually have their own convictions. They actually learn responsibility. So they could walk away from the home and say, this is what I believe. This is why I'm doing this. This is what mom and dad told me, but, but here's what I believe. Because they've instructed me with all of these truths, all of these principles from scripture. When we were in uh, Israel uh, last month, it was really interesting to me to, to hear from the, the Jews that would follow the, the Sabbath regulations. And the way that they followed the Sabbath regulations was, well, the rabbis said this. The rabbis said we could walk, you know, we can walk this many steps on the Sabbath. <clears throat> and the rabbis say that their interpretation is that we, can, you know, we, can't, we can't use a pen to draw because you can't create something on the Sabbath. And the, the elevator buttons at all the hotels on the Sabbath, it stops at every floor. <laughs> So you wouldn't have to push a button to, to create something, to work. And you can, you can actually, you can get a ride from someone as long as you're not, you can't do an Uber, but you could, if someone was just like randomly driving by and you jumped in their car, that'd be okay. But you can't start your car and you can't, you can't ask for a ride. So just these things where you're like, well, who decides? Well, the rabbis have interpreted for us. But they're not, the, the people following these instructions, they're not saying, what does God say? What is actually the intent of Scripture here? How do I obey this from the heart? They're just saying, okay, this person has told me what to do. And you think about it, that doesn't take any discernment. You actually don't build discernment that way. You don't grow in wisdom that way. You're just saying, okay, I'm taking it because this person said it. So that's the, the second, really the second action, the way to, to maintain a uh, tender conscience is to, to, what I'm calling, build your own convictions, to not just take things on hearing, but actually discern in Scripture. Number three is actually similar. He says, be most compelled by precepts and not just examples. Be swayed by precepts over examples. He writes, if we guide our course by precedence, instead of walking according to rule, conscience may soon be shipwrecked. And what he's getting at here is just a to, to similar idea, to just to follow others, but that, to just do things because that's the way we've always done them. Well, that's the way they do it, and it seems to work, so I'm going to do it that way. That's the way we've always done this. He uses the example of, of David and Goliath. I thought that's such a helpful example. David's showing up at the battlefield, and then he's, he's watching and saying, what is going on here? Why, why is this guy taunting day after day? Oh, this is just, you know, the, the army. This is just what happens. He gets up in the morning. He taunts us. We go back to our camp. And then we do it again the next day. And David, David shows up saying, why are we doing this? We have the, the living God on our side. Why are we not battling Goliath? So you think about that. D David is driven by the precepts. He's driven by the character of God, truth about God. Well, everyone else is just saying, well, just, this is what we're doing. <laughs> this is the only thing that makes sense. So this is why we have to, to teach the principles of Scripture. Again, think about parenting. Teach principles to our kids. This is why we do this. Here, here's what we're doing in our home, and this is why we do it. We're being driven by this truth and this truth and this truth. And there's so many areas you could, you could imagine all these decisions you make in life. I think about schooling is a big one. How do people school their children? And some people may, in their conscience, say, hey, this is a, the best way to do it. This is the only way that I, that I feel compelled to do it by the Lord. But for someone else to then adopt that, well, because it works for them, because I want my kids to be like their kids. Well, no, you need to be compelled by the truths of Scripture. Why would I do it this way? I think finances are another good example. You could look at someone and say, man, they've made a lot of good financial decisions. 
So I want to make sure I structure my budget in my life just like theirs. Well, that's great to, to follow an example, but what are the principles of stewardship that are driving you? What are, what are the principles of saving? What are the principles about finances that are driving your decisions? You have to be compelled by those things. I thought it was helpful. Someone was talking to me just about uh, in a ministry situation, just to think about if, I mean, you can think about it in our gathering, I think about it with the youth ministry. What would happen next week if you only had five kids? Or what would happen if all of a sudden an extra 100 kids came and you had 300 kids show up on a Sunday? What are the things that, that would be the same and what are the things that would be different? And why would the things be the same that are the same? What are the, the principles driving your decisions? That's just a helpful way to think about it because then it's like, okay, if all of a sudden the whole format changed, what are the, the principles, what are the things, the non-negotiables that we're going to go after? So I think just thinking that way in the home, what are the non-negotiables, what are the things, what are the principles driving this decision? Uh, number four, it turns, a, it turns a corner here, De- decline all necessary companionship with bad men. Really a, a different angle on, on intaking truth. Really the opposite, decline companionship with bad men. And really, you could say uh, influences. What, what influences you? You could be influenced by God's truth, or you could be influenced by worldliness coming from, from people. I think about, I mean, in our, in our day and age, obviously, social media, movies, what, what voices are you listening to? There is going to be truth coming at you from different sources. It's going to inform your conscience. It's going to inform what you think is right and wrong if you're listening to all these voices, if you're, if you're watching the shows that you're watching, the social media that you, that you look at, the people that you're around. There is a, a worldview at stake. You think about just the, the gender issue that's so prevalent, that, that's, that's really hidden in some ways. But you think about at the root of this, there, there is a, a worldview there that says that I, I am the product of the, of the culture, of the environment. I'm not accountable to my decisions. This is my organic makeup. This is just, just who I am. Versus the Bible that would say you are accountable for your actions. That these, these things are a result of, of heart motives. And those are very different worldviews. And if you let yourself sit under uh, other influences, other worldviews, it's, it's going to have an effect on your conscience. So what are the, the voices that you listen to? What are the things that you let influence you? Is it scripture? Is it those that love scripture? Or is, is there, like he says, bad men, other influences? I think about it like uh, just different people in my life that you have the, the friends that are, you're going to go out to lunch with that are going to influence you to eat healthy and the ones that are, that are not. You know, I think... Uh, I don't see him here, but Steve Kovac is the, is the eat healthy friend, you know. Steve Kovac, I've never gone to In-N-Out with Steve Kovac. I've never gone to Whataburger with Steve Kovac. But there are other people, I won't say, I won't say their names, that it's like Whataburger, you know, twice a week. And it's like, and I love that. But you have the, the influences. Those things do influence you, you know, in a practical level what you eat. But you think about what you think. The, the kinds of conversations, those things are going to influence you. That's number four. Number five. He says, beware of lax interpretations of scripture precepts. Beware of lax interpretations of scripture precepts. Uh, really driving home the point, you have to know scripture. And really what he's going after here are, you know, Jerry, Jerry Bridges has a book called Respectable Sins. Think about these things that we might say, oh, that, that's okay. You know, gossip, slander, complaining, discontentment just to actually say, what does God say about those things? When God says, do all things without complaining, without grumbling, to not, to not minimize that. Well, it doesn't mean this. When he says, let no unwholesome talk come from your mouth, to hold that high, to not, to not lax on, on what, that, what that would be saying, how that would indict you. So beware of lax interpretations, especially in those areas that we might, we might give into. Things like gossip, things like just complaint, grumbling, uh, things we might call, I just, I'm just frustrated right now. Your conscience will be, will be seared, will be, will be hurt if you allow little, little sins, what we would call little sins, that will affect your conscience. Number six, he says, cherish the most vilifying and debasing thoughts of yourself. Cherish the most vilifying and debasing thoughts of yourself. This one was kind of a surprise. Think really lowly of yourself. If you want to build a tender conscience, think lowly of yourself. 
He says, they who walk most humbly will walk most circumspectly. Then he goes on to say, he who is already vile in his own eyes is likely to take the most effectual care so that he may not take himself more vilely by sin. I love uh, John Newton. Similarly, he says that uh, the holiness of a sinner, he defines the the holiness of a sinner, the most holy people, he says, principally consists in self-abasement and in admiring views of Jesus as a complete Savior. To, To see Christ as an exalted Savior and to see yourself as a lowly sinner. And both those things go hand in hand, to to see Christ for who he is and his majesty and his glory, and to see yourself, all your sin, all your lack, your weak faith, to to put Christ high in your own heart. That is how you build a a tender conscience. This isn't to be melancholy, to be like, oh man, woe is me, but just to see yourself rightly in light of God's truth, in light of God's glory. Uh, Number seven, He says, watch against formality in God's service. Formality in God's service. This would be just, you think about going going to church, going through the motions. Uh, You actually train your heart. You know, you show up to sing a song. You're not thinking about it. You don't mean it. I mean, you're training your heart to be hypocritical. I'm going to say these words to the Lord, and I don't actually mean them. I'm not actually thinking about them. You know, I'm going to pray this prayer in front of people. I'm not actually contemplating what I'm praying. I'm just doing this out of duty, out of, out of a, you know, kind of a religious exercise. When we do that, we actually train our hearts to be hypocrites, to say, I'm going to say things that I don't mean. I was thinking about uh, my daughter is playing uh, elementary girls basketball. And uh, really sweet, really cute. But it's, it's interesting as you watch these girls, you know, they're trying to just get the, the framework of fundamentals and it's like all of a sudden they're playing defense and they're just locked in to their defend, you know, the person they're defending and the ball's in the air and the ball's over here, you know, next to them, but they're playing defense. And at some point it's like the, the reason you're playing defense is to, to stop them from scoring, to get a rebound so you can score. And in the, you know, in the fundamentals, in all these activities, they actually forget, oh yeah, I need to get the ball. Oh yeah, I'm actually trying to score. That's the point of the game. So just thinking about that, that we can, we can be like that. We go through these activities. Here's all these things that we're doing, and we lose sight of, oh yeah, what are we after? We're actually here to worship. Our hearts need to be engaged in this. Number eight. Number eight. He says, take heed of lying under any guilt unrepented of or relapsing into sin. Hebrews 3.13 uh, the exhortation to, to actually exhort one another so that we won't be hardened by the hypocrisy of sin, by the deceitfulness of sin, rather. This is to, just to keep short accounts with sin, to not, to not let uh, sin go unrepented of in the heart when you see sin. Because a tender conscience is not to say that we're going to be sinless, we're going to be free of sin, but it's actually to, to keep short accounts. When you see, when there's guilt, when you know this thing is wrong, to, to not stay there, to recognize, to confess those things before the Lord, to not fall back into the things that you've struggled with in the past, to, to work hard, to, to fight against those things. That's the idea here, is to, to just have a, to make short accounts with sin. Confess sin quickly. Number nine, let nothing tempt you to go against the dictates of conscience. Really, don't, you could say, don't ever sin against your conscience. Romans 14 is a, just a great passage in dealing with the, the conscience. As Paul's talking about really living in love with each other, with people that have different consciences, with the strong and the weak brother, people that are saying, I can, I can do this, I have this freedom. Others that are saying, I don't have this freedom. But in Romans 14, he says, let every man be fully persuaded in his own mind. And he goes on to say in Romans 14, 23, whatever is not from faith is sin saying whatever you do not think is right, if, you, if you're going to do something and you're not sure this is right before the Lord, this would be pleasing to God, I'm not convinced, and you still do it. That's sin. To, to not sin against your conscience. Again, our conscience isn't, isn't God's word. It's not perfect. It needs to be informed by Scripture. But it is this tool that God has given. Don't, don't minimize that. Don't, don't sin against it. Don't sear your conscience. It is a gift from the Lord. 
Martin Luther, you, I'm sure you, many of you have heard of his, his quote. He's standing in the Diet of Worms on trial for his, for his Protestant uh, theology. He's on trial. He's having to defend himself. In his response, he says, My conscience is captive to the word of God. I cannot and I will not recant anything. For to go against conscience is neither right nor safe. I think that's the attitude we need to have. It is not right or safe to go against conscience. Uh, Number 10, just a couple more here. He says, fortify yourself against carnal fear and sense of danger. Fortify yourself against carnal fear and sense of danger. Really the idea here is just to remind ourselves that the the Christian life is, is a life of hardship. Paul says to Timothy in 2 Timothy 2.3, suffer hardship with me as a good soldier of Christ. That, that part, of a, part of being called into the, the family of Christ is, is a call to suffering. Those who desire to, to live a godly life in Christ Jesus will be persecuted. That's what Paul says. So just to remind ourselves, to fortify our hearts, especially in the, the culture that we're in, I think this one is so helpful just to put in front of us the culture that we're in, that there, there may be fear and danger coming. Those are the things, when, when, fear, when fear is present, when danger is upon us, that is what's going to tempt us to sin against our conscience, when there's actually a cost, when it's going to be hard to, to press on, when it's going to be hard to, to follow through on our convictions, when, when there's you know, potential danger coming for us. So to actually prepare our hearts ahead of time, how do we prepare our hearts to be ready to stand firm, to feed our hearts with truth, to to dig a well of truth we can draw upon? That's the idea here, is to to fortify yourself so that when fear comes, when you're actually faced with real danger, you will stand firm. He says, uh, Crusoe says, remember that your business is to commend yourselves to God, your Father in heaven, Though your mother's children upon earth are angry with you, and though brethren hate and cast you out for his name's sake. I think that's just, uh, again, so helpful for us, just in this, in this present culture, where things are going. You, you see these storm clouds on the horizon, just to fortify our hearts, to, to stand firm. Two more here. Number 11, live as being under the continual view of God. Live as being under the continual view of God. The idea here again of fear of the Lord. To every day to wake up knowing that that God sees, that God knows, that God watches, that he's present. Jesus says in Revelation, uh, in his rebuke to the churches, he says, all the churches will know that I am he who searches minds and hearts. And I will give to each one according to your deeds. Just the Lord is the, the searcher of the heart. He knows the motives. He is present. He knows what we're thinking. So live that way. Live under the, the fear of the Lord. Live under the, the view of God. God is watching. And then lastly, number 12. And really this could be, I think, top of the list. You kind of have, I think, two, two mandatory things here. Really, it's to, to feed your heart with Scripture Number one, to the spiritual knowledge. Number 12, to pray without ceasing. So be a, of the word and of prayer. If you're going to boil it down to two points. Pray without ceasing. He writes, the way to be secured from sinful falls is to be much upon our knees. Just to realize our own insufficiency, that we're not the ones that keep ourselves. We're not the ones that, that gave us. We didn't get a, a tender conscience because of something we did. A clean, a clean conscience. This is what, what Jesus purchased for us at the cross, a gift from God. To maintain that, well, God has to do that work. We have to, to humbly come before him, realize our own insufficiency and his power to, to maintain for us, in us, just a, a tender conscience, a, a pure heart. And just to, just to close, again, why, why this matters why, why this all matters, why it's important to maintain a tender conscience. As I mentioned, in, in Hebrews and in 1 Timothy, you have this connection between, between faith and the conscience. Uh, just look at one more passage, 1 John 3.21. In Hebrews, he says, Hebrews 10.22, he said, having full assurance of faith, 
and, and hearts sprinkled clean from an evil conscience. You have this connection of faith and the conscience. First Timothy 1.19, he said, holding faith in a good conscience. Well, 1 John 3.21 says, Beloved, if our heart does not condemn us, we have confidence before God. If our heart does not condemn us, we have confidence before God. And the heart is used several different ways in Scripture. Here in 1 John, he's, he's using the heart really uh, like the conscience. Uh, the heart here is he's using it. He talks about it. It condemns us. It excuses us. Uh, it brings God's truth to bear in our hearts. So really, like when he says the heart does not condemn us, you could, you could say the same idea of the conscience. To actually have a, a pure life before God. Uh, and you see the connection here that this one has confidence. Or on the flip side, that you could say a self-condemning heart would void our confidence. A heart that does condemn us would void our confidence in the Lord. This is what's at stake, is our, our confidence in God. A guilty conscience limits our faith, lowers our view of Christ, minimizes our confidence. You know, we use the word assurance of salvation. And that, that can be kind of nebulous sometimes. What does that mean? Well, well a confidence a confidence in the Lord, assurance that I am, I am confident in the blood of Christ. I am confident I'm one of his children. I've seen his work in my life. I, I've said no to sin. I've seen growth in this area. I've seen him work powerfully, supernaturally in my heart. So that's what's at stake here in this, in this victory, in this battle for a tender conscience is to, to see Christ, to exalt Christ in our hearts, to see him as the, the, the savior that he is. I think about... Uh, just this idea of, in the book of Job, you have Satan in the, the courtroom of the Lord, you know, accusing, he's called the accuser of the brethren. You know, just think about that, we have a song, you know, when Satan tempts me to despair and tells me of the guilt within, that Satan would accuse us, say, this one is guilty, this one does not deserve to be here. And you think about the one with a, a guilty conscience is saying, yes, that's right, I'm so guilty. But the one with a, a tender conscience it's not that we're not guilty. It's say, yes, I am guilty. He is right. I am guilty before God. And my guilt has been paid for at the cross. To, to have a clean conscience, you can say that with assurance. That my guilt has been paid for at the cross. Yes, I am guilty. But I am looking only to the blood of Christ. I'm looking only to, to him for salvation. I'm looking only to him for hope in this life and the life to come. So that's why, that's why it matters. That's the, the encouragement to maintain a tender conscience for the sake of, of cherishing Christ in your hearts, of seeing him as the, the great savior that he is. So would you pray with me as we close? God, just thank you for your word. Thank you for just what you have done to, to secure for us a clean conscience. Lord, just thank you for um, the opportunity to be together, to, to hear from your word. I pray that the men and women here would would walk away encouraged, Lord, uh, convicted even in areas if there needs to be conviction, Lord, and just uh, bolstered with your truth so that we could maintain tender hearts, uh, hearts that would just uh, want to seek, that would seek to, to please you, that would want to maintain a pure thought life before you so that you would be exalted. And the first place you would be exalted, Lord, would be in our hearts, would be in our thoughts, and that would flow out into our conversations with others, and that would flow out into a sinful world so that we could be lights for your gospel. Pray this thing, Jesus, in your name. Amen.